What an honor to return to my home under these circumstances. Um, now I understand why the Lord spoke to me earlier this week and I thought maybe he was giving me direction for this morning but alas it was just a tidbit maybe sometime I will be able to come back and teach it but I was reading about um, Joseph's introduction of his father and his brothers to Pharaoh and Joseph said when he asked to his father and his brothers he said when he asks you what your occupation is tell him that you are shepherds for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians that's interesting go ahead and fess up that you're shepherds and know that when you do it will not be a sign of merit to Pharaoh and the Egyptians because every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. And the Lord told me to tell you something. If you have shepherd problems, it's not the shepherd, it's the Egypt nature in you. And until you kill the Egypt nature, you can never be pleasing to God. Yeah, that's heavy. Let it sink in. There are some people who have shepherd problems. When I got to Calvary, there was a lady there. And um, she had had a history of having issues with every pastor who had served that church from Brother Chambers on. And she had come from the church in Newark where Brother Dyer was the pastor, and she had caused him trouble. And so when I got there, believe it or not, she had problems with me. But it wasn't Brother Dyer, Brother Chambers, Brother Stewart, Brother Ferguson, Brother Elledge, and it wasn't me. It was her intractable Egypt nature. Egypt is a type of sin. And so my two-minute appetizer comes to an end with this. If you have shepherd problems, it's probably the Egypt nature in you. And if you repent and get rid of the Egypt nature, you'll be surprised how much better you get along with the shepherd that God's placed in your life. That was free. <laughs> Sister Nyla, you rule. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Donella. Whatever you promise to pay, it will be worth it all. <laughs> ah, that made my trip home worth everything. Now I got a little, got a little something else I need to take care of. Um, Sister Rose, it's so good to see you sitting one, two, three, four, five, six <laughs> seats from the back. If you will please speak to my wife after church because she's moved to the back row. What's the deal?
Steph, it's so good to see you. Get to spend a little bit of time with you. The last time Stephanie and I were together, we were at a funeral. And so uh, it had been a while since we'd seen each other, and Jimmy was with me, and Stephanie and I were just being cousins, and he leaned up. He said, you two are so loud. Ah. <laughs> uh, your pastor was such a great blessing to the conference in Thailand a couple of three weeks ago, and um, he is not leaving as in going somewhere else. He is here in the will of God. However, from time to time, the call of God upon him will require that he travel a little bit so do not begrudge the work of the kingdom God calls us and then he puts us in the body as it pleases him and um, Brother Spellman and I had the privilege of preaching together on Friday night at in Thailand and he was powerfully used of the Holy Ghost and uh, delivered a word that was a blessing to that meeting, and uh, you need to know that. Now, if you will stand, and if you will, whoever's helping me with scriptures, we're going to be going to Psalm 138, 7, and then we'll be going to 2 Chronicles 21, Psalm 138, 7, and then 2 Chronicles 21. As always, it is good to be with my mother-in-law, without whom I would not have had the wife that I have. Are you standing yet, Sister Dunlap? Yes, you are. Okay. This Psalm 138, 7, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. Second Chronicles 21, 1. Now Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers, was buried with his fathers in the city of David, and Jehoram his son reigned in his stead. Now when Jehoram was risen up to the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and slew all his brethren with the sword, and divers also of the princes of Israel... Jehoram was 30 and 2 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 8 years in Jerusalem, and he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. That was not a compliment. Like as did the house of Ahab, for he had the daughter of Ahab to wife, and he wrought that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And I want to preach to you for the next little while, revival in the middle of your mess. Has anybody here ever been in a mess? I'm not going to ask you if you're in a mess now. But your circumstances do not define God's plan and His will for your present or for your future. Lord Jesus... Let your anointing come upon me now to preach the word that you have given me for this people. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will let revelation come into this house. And let our minds be open, our spirits be open to uh, your word to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. First, it was the bombing of the Marine Barracks in Beirut, Lebanon, then 9-11, and uh, the uh, Twin Towers in New York City and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., Iraq, Sandy Hook, Boston, Ferguson, Paris, San Bernardino, Orlando, Bangladesh, Brussels, France, Orlando, and most recently, New York City. There's no doubt that our world is in a mess. The past several months we have witnessed the spectacle of terror 
anguish, fear, pain, and diabolical hatred that exceeds anything any of us had ever known before. Over the course of the past few years, it has suddenly become unsafe to travel in places that were always considered to be safe before. The scourge of radical Islamic terrorism has plunged our world into a kind of chaos that defies understanding. It's all finally reached our shores, uh, most recently in California of all places. Imagine that. December 2, 2015, San Bernardino, California, 14 people killed, 22 seriously injured uh, of, at all things uh, at a Christmas party. Orlando, Florida, June 12, 2016, Omar Mateen killed 49 and wounded 53 others in a nightclub shooting. Istanbul, Turkey, June 29, 2016, 41 people killed by a small group of terrorists in a bomb and gun attack on Ataturk Airport. Dhaka, Bangladesh, July 2, 2016, 22 killed in an attack on a restaurant that is incidentally only two blocks from where our missionaries, the Corbins, live. Nice, France, July 21, um, 84 people killed and, one, and 303 injured by a madman in a truck. Uh, New York City, October 31, 2017, a madman drove a rented pickup truck into cyclists and runners um, along a uh, Hudson River bike path. The deadliest terror assault or attack in New York City since the September 11 attacks of 2001. Sunday, October 1, 2017, Stephen Paddock opened fire on a crowd of concert goers in Las Vegas, Nevada, leaving 58 people dead and 851 injured. Worst mass shooting in U.S. history. And there just last week, a student in um, Kentucky opened fire at Marshall County High School, wounding 14 people and killing two. And then there is the uh, little guy in North Korea, Kim Jong-un, the rocket man, who threatens almost daily to strike the mainland of the U.S. with, some, with a nuclear device. And my list is by no means complete, but these incidents and others represent a major assault on the sensibility of any child of God. These events are spreading fear and panic around the globe. We certainly do live in the days of which Jesus spoke in Luke 21 when he said men's hearts would fail them for fear. We are living in a time... And if we are not careful and prayerful, we will become so fixated on the things that are going on around us that we will forget the promise of the last day outpouring that the Apostle Peter preached on the, on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. I would like to remind this congregation that all through God's Word, He has never left His people hopeless. He has never left his people without promise. And I've come to preach to you today. Your mess, your problem, your disaster, your world is not so bad that God cannot send revival in the middle of your mess. Things are not so bad that unified prayers of repentance would not make God turn his face toward us. Revival and restoration if we will cry unto him for mercy. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I read through the Bible every year, and as I was reading through the book of 2 Kings and the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah, God began to talk about, to me about the power of repentance. As I read, I was struck by how many times the nation of Judah was pulled from the brink of destruction by a king who would lead the people to seek the Lord. It happened so often, I'm hard-pressed to know where to start preaching, and uh, I hope I know when to stop. You need to hope I know when to stop. <laughs> but after the glorious promises that were made to David and even greater promises made to his son Solomon, it is heartrending to read of how Solomon refused to discipline himself and deny his fleshly lust to walk in obedience to God's ordinances. 
He had it all and deliberately and stubbornly squandered it for the sake of pleasing his flesh and indulging his superior intellect. Now, I'm a history buff, so bear with me for a few minutes of historical perspective. God chose Jeroboam to divide the kingdom while Solomon was still alive. And Solomon had been dead only a few days when Israel rebelled against his son. And Rehoboam was left with only the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And then soon after this division, the kingdom of Shishak, king of Egypt, came against the uh, nation of Judah, the southern kingdom, and carried out significant treasures of gold that had been the hallmark of Solomon's glory. So basically, within a year of uh, Solomon's death, there was already such a horrible erosion of the glory of the apex of that kingdom. This was the beginning of a series of judgments that God would send against Judah until Nebuchadnezzar finally destroyed any vestige of an independent kingdom of Judah. And the destruction of Judah would end with 70 years of captivity, but it would take place painfully over 345 years from the death of Solomon in 931 B.C. until the city of Jerusalem finally fell in 586 B.C. The thing that stands out to me this morning is how many times, how many, many, many times repentance served to turn God's wrath into mercy. Second Chronicles 12 records that even though Rehoboam lost most of his kingdom because of his stubborn arrogance, he still forsook the law of God. His trouble and losses did not serve to bring him to repentance and righteousness. But when he looked out the window and saw the Egyptians and the Ethiopians coming against Jerusalem, grabbing land and plunder as they came, in 2 Chronicles 12, 6, it says, The king and the princes humbled themselves and said, The Lord is righteous. Now That doesn't sound like much of a repentance prayer to me. If you're involved in sin, if you are allowing carnality to destroy your walk with God, I'd suggest you do a little better than just saying the Lord is righteous. But the Bible says that when those princes of Judah simply acknowledged the righteousness of God, God sent a prophet to them, 2 Chronicles 12, 12 7. And the Lord, the Lord saw they humbled themselves. The word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them. Humble themselves. All they did was say, The Lord is righteous. But I will grant them some deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. The most powerful prayer you can pray is a prayer of repentance. The most, the most powerful action in which you can engage if there's a mess in your life is to turn to God. I'd like to see the days when people crawl to the altar with tears and crying, but the Word tells me that there's something happens when your heart simply turns toward God and says, I've been wrong. And the Lord is righteous. It's amazing to me. All God was looking for was the smallest indication that his people were willing to repent and he came to their rescue. Now God's final verdict on Rehoboam was he did evil. But in spite of all the evil that Rehoboam did, God was still willing to hear his smallest prayer of repentance. And that should give hope to every backslider, every sinner, and everyone who's ever failed God. And if you are walking today in a path that is not consistent with the principles of God's Word, I bring you hope, I bring you hope, I bring you hope. If you will turn from your wicked ways, if you'll acknowledge the righteousness of God, if you'll turn your heart toward Him, God will hear you and God will change the course of your life because of the power of the prayer of repentance. Is it any wonder the prophet Isaiah wrote, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. 
Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return. Let, let him return to the Lord, for he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The commandment of the Lord. I am here to preach to you today, no matter how bad your mess is. God wants to send you revival. God wants to stir that which was lost. God wants to recover that which has strayed. God wants to bring revival in the middle of your mess. Next, there was Rehoboam's king, son, King Abijah. He only reigned three years, but during his three years, he got in a war with the northern kingdom, King Jeroboam. During the battle, Jeroboam's troops ambushed Abijah's army and surrounded them. 2 Chronicles 13, 14 tells the story. And when Judah looked back, behold, the battle was before and behind. And they cried unto the Lord. And the priests sounded with the trumpets. Then the men of Judah gave a shout. And as the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass, God smote Jeroboam and all of Israel before Abijah and Judah. And if you're here this morning... And that voice of the accuser has told you that you're too far gone to worship. You're too far gone to lift your hands. Uh, There would be something hypocritical if you would act like you were touched by what you feel here. I want you to understand something. When they were in the midst of being surrounded by the uh, army of Israel, uh, the priests shouted. They began to worship. The men, the, the priests blew the trumpets. The men shouted and God turned the battle in their favor because they turned toward him. Now, if you're used to hell, fire, and brimstone preaching, this probably isn't going to ring your bell. If you like to see people squirm and wallow in their sins. This probably isn't going to be what you're looking for. But it is what's in the Word. Verse 18, 2 Chronicles 13, Thus the children of Israel were brought under at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed because they relied on the Lord God of their fathers. How dare God? I mean, I I feel the spirit of the elder brother rise up sometimes and say, I've been here doing right all along. Isn't anybody going to have a party for me? Oh, get over yourself. God will have mercy on whom he chooses to have mercy. And when I need mercy, I'm sure glad he isn't asking you if I, should, if I deserve it or not. And then I've heard those folks who say they would not turn to God in their time of trouble because they had not served him before they got in trouble. Uh, I don't know if it's because they think they're so big and so bad they can just tough it out. Some kind of a Hero martyr complex all wrapped into one. Well, I didn't serve God in the good time, so I guess I'll just take my lumps. Oh, you'll get over that about 10 seconds into hell. You know, those are our only two options. I mean, I'm not preaching hellfire and brimstone, but it's either heaven or hell. There is no door C. Maybe they don't want to look weak in the face of their trouble. I want you to know something. At 65 years of age, I'm telling you, life can throw you stuff that makes you weak whether you want to look weak or not. Maybe they know they don't deserve God's grace and mercy. Maybe they're the kind who always want to pay their own way. I don't need need anybody's 
I don't need anybody to pay for me. I'll pay for myself. Ah, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. His blood washed it white as snow. None of us deserve God's mercy or his grace. And if you emptied your bank account, no matter how big it is, you could never pay your own way to a blood covering. So all your assets, your cash, your credit, your resources, that doesn't work in God's economy. We all come to him on the level ground at the foot of the cross. Second Chronicles 28, we get to one of the worst of all the kings of Judah. His name was Ahaz. He perfected sin to the place that God described him like this. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. King Ahaz was so depraved that he offered his living children to Baal in a fiery sacrifice that makes today's abortionists and their political and media defenders look almost human. He had a big brass idol to Baal. And its arms were stretched up like this. And those stretched up arms made a trough into the belly of that diabolical image. And they would build a fire and heat that image until it was almost molten. And then they would take the, ki the king's own babies and throw them into that fire to be consumed in some heathen worship ritual. When Ahaz died, his son Hezekiah was made king. And Hezekiah was as good as Ahaz was evil. There was a revival under King Hezekiah. <laughs> you say, but you don't know how bad my dad was. Nah, you come and stand before God all by yourself on your own terms. Brother Rose preached a message about Hezekiah's revival. I've never forgotten it. Hezekiah restored everything his father had desecrated. And Hezekiah offered the only Levitical sin offerings, goat or bullock, that are mentioned in all of Second Chronicles. Hezekiah's revival was so widespread that it even reached across the border into the northern kingdom of Israel. It was an international revival. You've got to understand, this church is not here by happenstance. This church is not here by accident. God established this church. It's not your church. It's not my church. It's his church. And he said he would build his church. Get this. He said, I'll build my church if I like at hell's gates. And hell's gates will not be able to prevail against my church. This is God's church. So it's no wonder this church has had an international influence. Missionaries. Brother Rose's ministry on by radio. And I'm a product of this church. According to Delta Airlines, I flew over 130 to 80,000 miles last year preaching the gospel. This is God's church and it is his will for this church to have an influence that reaches beyond this county. <laughs> Hezekiah's revival reached across international boundaries. People traveled to Judah 
to be a part of Hezekiah's revival. So if somebody shows up here and they've driven a little distance, it's God's will. And I'll never forget when Brother Rose preached about the restoration of the Feast of Passover under Hezekiah. And he stood at that pulpit and he wept as he talked about the restoration that happened during the reign of Hezekiah. The more Hezekiah attempted to please the Lord, the more the Lord blessed him and the kingdom. I got news for you. If you'll follow the leading of the man of God, hear me today, if you'll follow the leading of the man of God as he attempts to please the Lord, the more you please the Lord, the more the Lord will bless this church and bless your family and bless your life. And when the Assyrian king Sennacherib came against Judah to destroy, destroy Jerusalem, Hezekiah cried to the Lord, and he took Sennacherib's letter and spread it out in the house of the Lord, and God delivered Judah from the Assyrians. Donna, do you remember the letter that my granddad taped to the altar? Do you, you remember that? <laughs> this you stand on a foundation of people who believed the word. And there was a family sent a letter. Dear Mr. Rose, you and your congregation, your people, are not welcome to come and visit my mother. She was born A, and she mentioned a church, and she will die A. Probably it wasn't politically correct, and maybe today we could have been sued, but that letter got taped to the altar. Sister Logston, were you part of the church then? And we'd just stand in front of that altar and pray over that letter. And at that time, Mrs. McDivitt had not received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but I got news for you. Even though they locked us out. Oh, I went with Granddad the day he went to the house and knocked on the door. I was right there. When she came to the door and she said, Did you not get my letter? I told you you couldn't come in and pray for Mama. Well, we went back and got in the car and that didn't stop the man from praying. You might not let me pray in the front room, but you can't stop me from praying in my car in front of your house. And God is able to walk through the walls and answer my prayers. And I was there when we baptized her on a stretcher after all of that. I was there when God filled her with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You hear me? God will hear the prayers of his people. Finally, God sent a prophet to Hezekiah that you're going to die. Now, if God ever sends you to tell me that, don't open the conversation with that. Just, you know, say a few nice things first. Talk to me about heaven. Read to me about pearly gates and golden streets and jasper walls and all that. And Hezekiah cried to the Lord, and the Lord gave him 15 more years. Oh, the prayer of the righteous availeth much. God will hear the prayer you pray in the middle of your mess. And your mess isn't so bad that God's ear is not tuned in to your cry today. 
good king Hezekiah was followed by his evil son Manasseh, who was such an evil king that God sent the Assyrians against him. They took him captive and carried him into Babylon. And this is, this is the seed bed of this message that I'm preaching to you today. 2 Chronicles 33, 12. Now, when I read that, Manasseh was so evil he got carried into captivity. I said, yes! It's what I want to happen to all those wicked folks. Lock them up. I didn't say anything. I can't help what you thought when I said lock her up. Anyhow. Keep on reading. 33, 12 of 2 Chronicles. And when he was in affliction, after he was in prison in Babylon. He besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly. This is the most wicked king who ever sat on the throne of Judah. He's gotten carried to Babylon and locked up in prison. And when he got to prison, he started praying and humbled himself before the God of his fathers, prayed unto him, and, he's, and he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. God caused the Assyrians to take Manasseh out of prison, carry him back to Jerusalem, and put him back on the throne after all he had done, after all all of the sin, after all of the idolatry, after all of the depravity, God said, I heard him praying. And he went, he sent a, he sent a, uh, 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 he sent a message and he had him restored to the throne in Jerusalem. If God wills restore a heathen king out of captivity in a prison, God will hear your prayer today. Maybe you've known that all your life. I only found that out a few months ago. Can you imagine? How dare God say, you know, I'm not going to name names because you're related to some of them, but they were so happy when people got what was coming to them. But that's not how God operates. Why can't we get off the judgment seat and stand in the stands if necessary? And when God brings a sinner to repentance, we cheer. For his mercy endureth forever. For his mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. Second Chronicles 34, Manasseh's grandson Josiah became king when he was only eight years old. When he was 16, he began to seek the Lord. And God heard the prayers of the 16-year-old king and turned away his wrath from Judah. You're never too far gone to repent and call on the Lord for mercy. You can have revival in the middle of your mess. I suppose it would be difficult to find a worse time in all the history of God's word than the years following the death of the good and righteous King Jehoshaphat. His son Joram, or Jehoram, same same king, just a different pronunciation, became so wicked. He was so wicked that God cursed him with a very painful and horrible disease of his bowels from which he died. And this disease was prophesied against him by Elijah. And after Joram's death, it seemed like God turned out the lights on Judah and his promise to David. 
For in those dark and horrible days, Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah, forced her way onto the throne of Judah. This wicked and treacherous woman killed her own grandchildren in order to secure his place of power to maintain her wicked hold on the throne of David. By the time we get to the end of 2 Chronicles 22, it would seem that everything's lost. The only glimmer of hope was King Joram's daughter, Jehoshaphat, who was the wife of the priest Jehoiada, took one of Ahaz's sons, Joash, and hid him in the temple for seven long years. When that little heir to David's throne was seven years old, Jehoiada and the faithful elders of Israel anointed him king. And 2 Chronicles 24 records he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. After the wickedness of jo Joash's predecessors, God sent revival to Judah because of a little boy who simply decided to do what was right. I'll be the first to admit he was strongly influenced by his uncle, who was the, also the high priest. I'll admit that everything in Judah was not perfect during his reign. But you've got, to, you've got to understand, God saw that Judah was turning from their wickedness and he turned their, his wrath from them. May I remind you that Jonah, who preached the great Nineveh revival, was only a few days removed from a repentance prayer meeting in a, in a whale's belly. I'm preaching to you today that your mess isn't so bad that you can't have a revival. Your life is not so broken that God cannot fix it. And all it takes for you is to call out to Him in repentance this morning. If you'll turn your heart toward Him, He will hear and He will answer and He will bring revival in the middle of your mess. The Rose used to say, you don't get good and then get God, but you get God and he makes you good. And if you were wondering when I was going to get to my last scripture, I'm here. You can stop praying about that and start focusing on all the folks that need to repent. I've already quoted it once, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. Would you stand with me? And when I was a boy, they used to sing, God, any rivers you think are uncrossable God any mountains you can't tunnel through God specializes in things thought impossible and he will do what no other power can do I'm not exactly sure how you want me to make this altar appeal because by very nature my title assumes that some of us, if not most of us, if not all of us, have a mess of some kind. I want you to know that your mess does not define tomorrow for you. How many people here drive cars? I didn't say you, you drive well. I just say you drive cars. Did you ever notice the difference in the size of the rear view mirror and the windshield? Do you know why the windshield is so much bigger than the rearview mirror? 
because your tomorrow is far more important than your yesterday. Where you're going is more important than where you've been. God, any rivers you think are uncrossable. God, any mountains you can't tunnel through. God specializes in things thought impossible. And he will do what no other power can do. So if it's a big mess or a little mess, if it's a medium-sized mess or almost no mess at all, and you'd like to have some revival in the middle of it, would you just leave where you are and come and stand here in the presence of the Lord? We're going to pray together.